are gathering in this place today and we're seeing God move in a powerful way, we know that we still serve a miracle working God. And we know that God is still in the place of healing and God is still in the place of moving and we can come into this place and we can worship him and we can lift him up and exalt him and he says that when he is lifted up and exalted he draws all people unto himself and so today I want to know if you're ready to lift up Jesus and exalt him in this place let's worship him church let's worship him here in this place I want you to give him the loudest shout of praise that you can here in this place give him all the glory give him all the praise Let's watch God move. Let's thank you for who he is and how he's working in this place. Take three seconds and give him the loudest shout of praise you can in this place. One, two, three. Man, I know it's going to be a powerful day. And uh, today I'm excited to be able to welcome one of our friends all the way from Raleigh, North Carolina, who's come to be here with us. They were able to plant Focus Church over 11 years ago. He and his wife, Ashton, he's here with his brother, Mitchell. He has got an incredible message I know he's going to share here with us today. So I want you to put your hands together and give the loudest Freedom Church welcome you possibly can to Pastor Mike Santiago. You may be seated. My father used to sell fireworks. He was the regional manager for an entire market of fireworks tents. And when I was nine years old, I was assistant to the regional manager. And uh, we would go to every Piggly Wiggly, every uh, Winn-Dixie. I don't know if y'all have Winn-Dixie around here, but we go to every Walmart, every Food Lion. You know those tents that pop up a couple weeks before 4th of July, a couple weeks before New Year's Eve. My dad was in charge of all of those tents. So we'd drive around, and I was assistant to the regional manager in charge of quality control, making sure that the shipments were right and that the product placement was correct. And what would happen is if anybody had poked their finger through the plastic and ripped out a couple of fireworks but left the rest, we got to keep the leftover product that wasn't damaged but wasn't good enough to sell. You know what I'm saying? Maybe it fell off the truck. Uh, maybe it was broken. And As you can imagine, over the course of the three weeks leading up to 4th of July, we accumulated a ton of fireworks. <laughs> we didn't just celebrate the 4th of July. We celebrated the 5th of July, the 6th of July, the 7th of July. We had Veterans Day fireworks, Memorial Day fireworks. We had Mother's Day fireworks. Uh, we had fireworks for every occasion, all right? My dad preached a good message at church on Sunday, good fireworks, you know? And over the course of the, of the month of July and the month of December, I'd invite my neighbors over to come see all these fireworks in our garage and we'd pop open the garage door and it would be like the Shekinah glory coming out of the garage like oh and my neighbors they would all come over and they would say man where'd you get all these fireworks from how'd you get access to all these fireworks and what I would do is I would just shrug my shoulders I'd be like yeah whatever because what had happened is I had gotten used to something that was normal to me had become novel to them. See, it had become very standard for me to be around what was special to others. And if we're not careful, we'll come into church and we'll treat it like our, our dad just sells fireworks. And it'll just become a standard practice and we'll take it for granted. But I want to let you know this morning, we are in a very special place. Freedom Church is a very special place. And so we shouldn't come in here just shrugging our shoulders. Just because our dad sells fireworks doesn't mean they're not special. This is a very special house. So can we thank God for all that he's doing one time? Come on, let's thank God for his goodness and his grace. Don't get used to it. What's happening here isn't normal. Come on, let's just thank God. 
for what he's doing in this house. We worship you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't forget that your dad sells fireworks. And I know that I just honor the decision that your pastors have made to get healthy. It takes boldness and um, a, real, a real sense of, of understanding who you are when you step aside for a season to get healthy. And as they get healthy, we're going to get healthy too. Amen. And we're not just spectators to someone else's journey to health. Instead, we are participators in growing in our walk with the Lord. And so uh, let's just take a moment and let's pray. And let's ask the Lord to be with Pastors JR and Devin and to be with our time together this morning. Father, we look to your word as a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We thank you that our, our, dad, our dad sells fireworks. What's, what God is doing here is very special and we won't normalize it. We won't take it for granted. As a matter of fact, Lord, we will always honor you for your hand, your miracle working hand that is in this place. And we thank you for my brothers and sisters here in Ackworth, Georgia and what you're doing at Freedom. And uh, we love you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. And amen, thank you, worship team. You guys are really good. You guys are really good. Romans chapter eight, verse one, if you have a copy of God's word, that's where we're gonna be today. My name is Mike, and uh, I, I had the privilege of planting a church 11 years ago, and it's in Raleigh, North Carolina, and I get a chance to come alongside churches now on the road um, several weekends of the month, and I get to preach. Uh, for my friends, and so I'm glad to be preaching this morning. Do you like preaching? Uh, my church is 70% black. We get a little wild with it, okay? So you're going to have to at least meet me in the middle. Some of you I know, you probably didn't grow up like I have in my church, but I need you to at least shout me down a little bit. I, I know this is first service and all, but I promise it, we'll have a good time, okay? I left my snakes at home, so there's no poisonous snakes or anything like that, all right? I grew up Pentecostal, but not that Pentecostal. We drew the line at the snakes, so... There are tambourine every once in a while, but no snakes. Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. Are you ready for God's word? Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Come on. We're free from the law of sin and death, for what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. If you're looking for a theological term today, if you're one of those studious people, the term would be atoning sacrifice or atonement. It's why we partake of communion to remember the atoning sacrifice that Jesus paid on the cross. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us. In who? In us. How awesome is that? That might be fully meant in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but how do we live? According to the Spirit. Now listen, verse, four, verse 14, jump with me to verse 14. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Turn to your neighbor and say, I am a child of God. Turn to your other neighbor, your second choice. Say, I am led by the Spirit. Verse 14, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. So I'd like to preach to you today a message on what it means to be led by the Spirit. What does it mean to be led by the Spirit? And I'm reminded of a time several years back when we decided to take all of the children, cousins, aunts, uncles, and grandparents to a theme park in the summer in Orlando. Not a good decision. But we wanted our kids to know what hell was going to be like <laughs> so that they would get saved. So we had an altar call right there at the end of our day. And I was letting my buddy know, hey, we're taking a family vacation. And he, and he lives in, in Orlando. And he's like, dude, you need to try out my new business that I'm, that I'm starting. And I'm always leery of people that have new opportunities or new businesses. And I get Facebook messages all the time of new opportunities. And so I was like, well, tell me a little bit more. He says, I, I, just, I just started Sunshine Tours. And I was like, well, what's that? And he said, well, people with means. And I'm like, well, stop right there. I'm not one of those people, you know. 
He said people from Wall Street or athletes or actors, he goes, time to them is so valuable that they'll hire us to take care of all of the logistics for their vacation so that they can just enjoy the time with their family and not have to worry about what to do. And and it turns out that uh, you hire Sunshine Tours and at uh, the, the gate of, of, of Disney World or whatever, wherever you go, they'll meet you there and they take care of everything. And I said, okay, sign me up. So there's about 10 kids and six adults, 16 of us, and we're all going across the ferry ride. And he said, just look for the lady in the yellow polo when you get there. I said, okay, sure enough, we get there to the other side. We find the lady in the yellow polo and uh, she says, give me all of your tickets. We gave her all of our tickets. She opens up her app. She does all this stuff. She goes to the little counter. She does, all, and we're just sitting there, just having a good time. And she says, "Now we're going to go to the gate." She says, "When these gates open, all the families are going to go to the left." She said, "But we are going to go to the right." We're like, "Okay, whatever you say." So sure enough, the gates open, and everyone goes to the left, and our family goes to the right, and we got on a ride, no line. We get we get off that ride. We go to the next ride, no line. We go to the next ride, no line. And then she's like, you probably have to go to the bathroom. We're like, how did you know? (laughs) So sure enough, the bathroom was right there after ride number three. We all go to the bathroom. We go to ride four, no line. Ride five, no line. Ride six, no line. She's like, you're probably hungry for lunch. We're like, how'd you know? She says, sit right here in this corner booth. She goes and gets the food. She has a little side passage way. I don't know what kind of keys to the kingdom of God she had, but she had some sort of access. She brings us our food. We eat. We're all having a good time. And then we end up going around the park to the other side, rides six, seven, and eight. No line. We were done by two o'clock with everything. They say that the average family that goes to a theme park spends six to eight hours either waiting in line or deciding what to do next. And we were walking by people in front, you know, the lady in the polo was leading us, and we were looking at people filing for divorce in the middle of the, <laughs> of the theme park. Kids were having demonic attacks in the stroller, meltdowns of, of the worst kind. And we were walking around like fully confident. We got the lady with the yellow polo on our side. There has not been a line all day, and she knows where the clean bathrooms are. And I remember at the end of the day, my father-in-law were having, and I were having a discussion. We were like, man, that made so much sense. It made so much sense to relinquish control to a guide that knew what they were doing. The Holy Spirit does the same thing in your life. When you relinquish control of your decisions, your desires, your things, the Holy Spirit takes control and allows you to surrender your life to Christ. As a matter of fact, that's what Paul wrote in verse 14. It says, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. And I don't know about you, but I want to be led by the Spirit. See, everyone is led by something. If you're taking notes today, you can write this down. Everyone is led by something. Some are led by sin. Now, don't elbow them because they're sitting next to you, but some are led by sin. Many are led by others. They just go with the flow and they just do whatever everyone else does. And very few are led by the Spirit. It's not natural and it's not normal for us to be led by the Spirit. That's why it's so difficult at times. We want to follow what our flesh desires. We want to follow what the world desires. But I don't know about you, I'm a child of God, therefore I need to do what the Bible says, which is I need to be led by the Spirit of God. That's a good time to say amen for those who are practicing. So where does the Holy Spirit lead us? You asked such good questions that I had them put them on the screen. You're like, well, okay, I'm, I'm good with being led by the Holy Spirit, but where does he, he, he lead us? Well, number one, the Spirit leads us to Christ. The Holy Spirit will never lead you away from Christ. He will always lead us to Christ. It says in Romans 8, 3, for what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. See, there is a spirit at work in your life that draws men to Christ. It should draw you to love Jesus more. I mean, 
you're here at the early service this morning, so I know that you love Jesus more than the other two services, but the Holy Spirit will draw you to love Christ even more. Even more, A.W. A. Tozer says, I don't want the world to define God for me. I want the Holy Spirit to reveal God to me. See, the more the Spirit leads you, the more you'll, you'll fall in love with Christ. And so if you're like, I just want to love Christ more, then ask God to lead you through his Holy Spirit. Number two, the Spirit leads us to peace. The Holy Spirit will never lead you to chaos. It will never lead you to uh, d d disruption. It will always lead you to peace. It says in verse 5, those who live according to the flesh have their mind set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance to the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. The mind, pay attention here, the mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. That's why you can walk into an environment at your job that's very stressful, but because the Holy Spirit has led you to peace, you can have peace on the inside. I'm not after happiness in this life. I'm after peace. <laughs> oh, I'm preaching today. I'm not after what the world can give me. I'm after what the Holy Spirit can give me. And it's not based on external circumstances around me. It's based on what Christ has done through his spirit within me. So I can walk into an environment where everyone is freaking out but I've got peace on the inside because the Holy Spirit leads us to peace. See, but the mind is of God, that, that is governed by the Spirit is, is, a life, is life and peace. So we not only have peace, but we get to produce peace. See, not only do you have the peace within you, but then you could be a distributor of peace. Come on, somebody. So I don't just smoke it, I sell it too. Come on, somebody. Some of you got that testimony. You know, you know, you're like, that's my testimony. You're like, I used to be a dope dealer, but now I'm a hope dealer. Come on, somebody. <laughs> so the Spirit leads us to Christ. The Spirit leads us to peace. The, the next thing is this. The Spirit leads us to holiness. <laughs> we don't say this word a lot in church these days, but your appetite for who you once were will diminish the more led by the Spirit that you are. You won't be able to go to the same places that you used to go to because now you are uh, being what the Bible calls is sanctified. You're, you're, you're actually looking at your old self and saying, I can't do the things I used to do. Now, some of you, the Lord is still doing work in your life. You save, but you still cuss a little bit, you know. And, and what will happen is over time, as you, as you, as you grow in God, it'll be, you'll be led to holiness. Romans 8, 12 8 12 it says this therefore brothers and sisters we have an obligation but it is not to the flesh to live according to it for you live according to the flesh you will die if you live according to the flesh but if you live by the spirit you put to death look at this the misdeeds of the body and you will live i love what oswald chambers says he says holiness not happiness is the chief end of man Come on, somebody. There are some things that your body wants to do, but your new creation, your spirit, will not allow you to do. And I'm not talking about religious stuff. I'm not talking about the, 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 the attire that you wear on stage. I grew up in church. I was in church nine months before I was born. Anybody else grew up in church? I mean, I'm, I, I, I've been to more church than all of y'all combined, okay? I thought our baptismal tank was our pool. So I would just bring my bathing suit every time there was a water baptism. And I just jump in there every time. I loved communion Sunday because I got to eat the leftover body of Jesus <laughs> that was left over on the altar. So while my parents were talking for three hours in the lobby, deciding where to go to lunch, and it always ended up being Chili's every time, <laughs> I would just be eating the body of Jesus. And thank God it was juice, because if it would have been wine... I would have had to go to the AA meetings <laughs> at six years old. I grew up in church, and I wasn't allowed to chew gum in church. I don't know if y'all grew up like I grew up. I couldn't, I couldn't chew. I couldn't wear, if my mom saw these jeans, whoo, whoo. I, I, I mean, if she saw the hats that the worship team was wearing this morning, this is the house of God. 
That's not, the kind of, that's not the kind of holiness that I'm talking about. I'm talking about an internal conviction. I'm talking about something that doesn't just, doesn't just change what you look like on the outside, but it really gets to the core of who you are. And you say, I can't do what I used to do because I'm a new person. I've been made new by the power of the Holy Spirit. Another Tozer quote says, religion can reform a person's life, but it can never transform him. Only the Holy Spirit can transform. All right, number four. The Spirit leads us to understanding our new identity. Did you know you get a new name when you become in Christ? You get a new identity. You don't have to be the same person that you used to be. It says in verse 14, as we've read it now several times, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive, watch this, does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. This is very good. Some of you are still living in fear, but you've been adopted into Christ. You're a son of God, a daughter of God. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. Verse 16, the spirit himself testifies to our, with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, look at this then we are heirs, come on somebody, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Whoo! The distribution of wealth on the inheritance that is over your life is equal to that of Christ. Meaning God loves you as much as he loved Jesus. Oh, nobody wants to hear how much God loves them. In a world where, where a, a lot of us have broken relationships with our earthly father, you need to know that sonship and, and you are daughters and sons of God today. You are co-heirs with Christ. This is good. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs and heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we also might share in his what? Glory. You get to share in the glory of God today. No matter what you came in here with today, I want to let you know you are a son and daughter of the Most High God. You are loved by God. And you, my friends, have received a new identity in Christ. The old is gone and the new has come. And you get adoption papers from God. Number five. Are you ready? You're like, how many points does this guy have? I'm not even halfway done yet. I'm looking at the clock like, oh my gosh. The Spirit leads us to strength. See, and every time you have a moment of weakness, God will be your strength. It is not in your own strength. Some of you have more degrees than a thermometer. I want to let you know, it is not your education that's going to get you through this life. It is the Holy Spirit's strength in your moment of weakness. Actually, the vulnerability that is required sometimes is actually what God wants you to say. I can't do it, so I need you to be my strength. Verse 26 says, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our what? weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. When you run out of words to pray, the Spirit will begin to pray on your behalf. I'm weak. He's strong. I can't do it, but he can do it. And that's important. He's working on your behalf. He's bringing you in. If you feel weak today, just know you're in the right place. We came to a place with a strong power. A mighty fortress is our God. The righteous run to him and they are saved. I, I don't know about you, but when I get to the end of my rope, I thank God that I don't have to do things in my own strength. I thank God that I don't have to lead my three children in my own strength. I don't have to pastor my church in my own strength, but I can surrender to God and say, God, I am weak today, but in my weakness, you are strong. Number six, the spirit leads us to our ultimate purpose. Verse 27 says, and he searches our hearts and knows the mind of the spirit because the spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance to what? To the will of God. And we know that in all things, somebody say all things, God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to whose purpose? His purpose. Now let me, let me show you where the Spirit leads us. They're going to put all of them on the screen so that you can take a picture and tag me on Instagram at Mike Santiago. The Spirit leads us to Christ. The Spirit leads us to peace. The Spirit leads us to holiness. The Spirit leads us to understanding our new identity. The Spirit leads us to strength. The Spirit leads us to our ultimate purpose. Aren't you grateful that we have a Spirit that leads us to things where we're not just waiting on the rapture. I don't know about you. I grew up with a grandma. She's just waiting on the rapture. 
She's prepared for Y2K every day. <laughs> Coke bottles full of water, canned goods from the 80s. She's ready for Jesus to come back. In case she wasn't ready, she's ready to withstand the tribulation, you know? That's not the kind of life we're supposed to live. We're supposed to actually do something on, here on earth. If you are saved today, you actually are, are called to an ultimate purpose. So how, do we, how are we led by the Spirit? I'm so glad you, you asked such good questions. I had to put it on the screen. How do we lead by the Spirit? Number one, you have to release control. You can't be led by the Spirit and have control. You can't do it. You have to say, God, I, I give it. Now, this is hard because some of you are control freaks. You've checked your thermostat at home from your phone while I'm preaching. <laughs> some of you have looked at that clock back there more than you've looked at me because you're control. You're like, I got to go. Bob Evans, you know, the Baptists get to Bob Evans before I do, you know? You got to release control. Control is hard to release, but it's a critical part of being led by the Spirit. You have to release control. You have to say, God, whatever, whatever you have for me today, I take it. Whatever you're going to do in my life, whatever you want to do in my marriage, whatever you want to do in my family, however you want to get, uh, whatever you want to get out of my heart that does not belong to you, I relinquish control. It says in Galatians 5.16, so I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit which is what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other. Mm. So that you, listen to this, listen to this young people who are about to go back to school, so that you are not to do whatever you want. Can I preach hard in this church or no? You want me to sugarcoat it today or you want me just to, you want me to pander to your pockets so the offering's real good or what do you want? Let me tell you the truth. You can't do whatever you want. You have to do what the spirit wants. You can't live a life that's just like, I get to be in control. New year, new me. I'm my own person. I'm my own man. I'm my own. No, no, no. I am not my own. I belong to the spirit of God. And whatever the Spirit of God says, that's what we do. We are led by the Spirit. And how do, we, how do we release control? Well, we do it by surrender. Surrender. What is surrender? I'm so glad that you asked. I even have them put it on the notes because you asked such great questions. Surrender is a daily choice to let God lead. A daily choice to let God lead before your feet hit the floor. God, I give you my marriage today. God, I give you every sales call that I make, every, every, everything, every person I interact with. I, re, I, I surrender my whole life to you. I surrender my, as, as my kids get dropped off at school, I surrender to you. I don't want to let the enemy infiltrate my thoughts. I will not let the enemy infiltrate my heart. I'm not going to be led by my flesh. I'm going to be led by the Spirit. Release control. Number two, watch and pray. Watch and pray. You, 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 have, to, you have to sometimes pray with your eyes open. You have to say, God, where are you sending me today that maybe I could be used by you? Like, what, is this cashier at the grocery store someone that I'm supposed to witness to? Is my boss that I don't like that much someone that I'm supposed to witness to? Is my cousin who I know is going straight to hell, am I supposed to be the person? Am I, am I, are you using me to watch and pray? Am I the one that needs to be? Uh, it, it's actually, it's more like a yield sign. You keep moving in this life, but you watch and pray. I'm watching and praying. God, what are you saying to me today? What are you, if you want to be led by the Spirit, you need to live your life watching and praying. Matthew 26, where the disciples did not watch and pray. They fell asleep. It says, watch and pray, Jesus, so, so, that, so that you will not fall into temptation. Look at this. The Spirit is willing, but what? You got to watch and pray, church. In today's day and time, you have to watch and pray. You can't just go with the flow. You can't just assume everything is okay. You need to be vigilant in the spirit to be led by the spirit. That's a good time to say amen. Amen. You have to watch and pray. Why? Because there is a God-given assignment in every environment. That neighbor that never brings his trash cans in, doesn't cut his lawn, you want to call the HOA on him, maybe God's sending him, sending that person into your life so that you that maybe that's your assignment today. Maybe when you go to lunch today or brunch today or wherever you go after this, maybe God's giving you an assignment today, so watch and pray. You're not just meant to live this life. Next one is this, take a risk. You know how you spell faith? R-I-S-K. Take a risk. We celebrate those that are getting water baptized today. Why? Because they're, they're publicly professing their faith in Jesus Christ. They're taking a risk. They're saying, my life is not my own. It's, it belongs to the Spirit of God. James, the half-brother of Jesus, says this, In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is what? 
Oh, you got to get to work, church. You got to take a risk. We're not just here waiting on the rapture. We're going to invite every single person we know to church. We're going to witness before they even get to church. We're going to be the witnesses that we need to be as agents of Christ. Am I preaching this morning? Man, you got to take a risk. Risk getting involved in serving. Risk beginning to to tithe, risk beginning to step up and, and, and participate in the service. Some of you, you know, you wonder why God doesn't meet you where you're at, but your arms are crossed the whole worship service. Just take a risk and, you know, even just start with the holding of the television, you know. <laughs> and then, you know, graduate to the touchdown, you know. But take a risk. For some of you, that's the risk. You just need to express yourself and worship a little bit more. Oh, I just didn't grow up that way. That's okay. You're in a safe place at this church to express yourself and worship. You know, risk asking your neighbor how you can pray for them or asking your coworker how you can pray with them. See, the spirit is too powerful and our salvation is too significant for us to play it safe. That's why Holy Spirit is called the comforter. Have you guys heard this before? You heard it, he called the comforter, the advocate, the friend. See, I wrote this in my notes. Why would we need a comforter if what we are called to do is comfortable? He's the comforter. So go ahead and take a risk. Do something that's a little outside of your normal personality. All right. The next one is this, is you gotta rely on God's power. You gotta rely on, here's why risk sometimes seems foolish. Because you're trying to do everything in your own strength. It's like, when we, we, I was 24 years old when we planted the church, my frontal cortex hadn't even been fully developed yet. Like I was making really dumb decisions. Three kids in diapers, God said, move to North Carolina. We had never lived there before. I didn't know anybody. I, I'm not a trust fund kid. I literally had nothing. And he said, move to North Carolina, plant this church from scratch. I was like, okay, God. And sure enough, the first apartment we visited, the lady wouldn't do a credit check. Praise God. <laughs> We're like, this must be confirmation from the Lord because if she knew how broke we were, <laughs> she wouldn't be written to us. I can tell you that right now. Three kids in diapers. I got a job at Panera Bread, $7.25 an hour. Three children. Nothing wrong with working at Panera Bread. Just hard to provide for three kids and a wife working at Panera Bread. I can remember asking my manager, this is just 10 years ago. This isn't in the old timeies. This is just a, a decade ago, 24 years old. And I remember asking my manager at the end of my shift, would you mind not throwing the leftover food into the dumpster and just leave it next to the dumpster so I don't have to jump into the dumpster. We took a risk. I remember walking home, we only had one car, a trash bag full of bagels on my back just to feed the kids. But God had called us to it, and if he's called you to it, he'll see you through it. And so I remember telling the kids, you know, what's for breakfast? I'm like, bagels. They're like, what's for lunch? I'm like, bagels. <laughs> like, what's for dinner? I'm like, okay, come on now, three for three, bagels. I used to call it different things to kind of make it sound different. Like, hey, we're having uh, pizza boats, but we just carved out the bread of the bagels, you know? It was like sandwiches. It was a bagel, you know? So you have to know, you have to rely on God's power. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient to you for my power is made perfect. Look, in weakness, when you can't do it, God will see you through it. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly in my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. All right, last one is this. You got to give God the glory. Are you taking notes today? You got to learn to give God the glory. As the, as the band comes back up to make me sound more spiritual than I really am, you got you to give God the glory, man. I don't know about you, but I want my life to give God glory. I want every waking moment of my day to give God glory. I don't want there to ever be a time in my life where I'm not reflecting God's glory back on him. It is not for my accolades. It is not for my gain. It's not for me. It's for God. Everything you do in this life is not for yourself. It's for the glory of God. The miracles that you have encountered is for the glory of God. This church is for the glory of God. His church, the, the, the capital C church, is for the glory of God. This isn't about some, some guy telling some jokes with scriptures put in between. This isn't about a band that sounds so tight and so good, even though you guys sound so tight and so good. It's about the glory of God. It's about God getting the glory, his reflective nature of the glory. See, it says in Galatians 525, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. 
Why? Because we have to be quick to give God the glory. See, God calls us to do things that are beyond our ability so that he gets all the glory. Romans 8, 11, I'll close with this one verse. And the spirit, and if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead, look at this, will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Do you want to be led by the spirit today? I don't know about you, but I want to be led by the spirit. I don't want anything to get in the way of the Spirit's prompting in my life. I, I want to be led by the Spirit of God. Can we bow our heads across this room? Maybe you'll be honest and vulnerable today and you'll say, you know what, Pastor Mike, I really do need to be led by the Spirit. I've, I've let my fleshly desires creep in. I've let my, my, my worldly desires creep in. And maybe it's something small and insignificant. Maybe it's something big and you know it and the Spirit is already doing the work and it's convicting you today. I just want to encourage you today. I came all the way from North Carolina just to let you know that the Spirit of God wants to be your guide. The Spirit of God wants to lead you into peace. The the Spirit of God wants to lead you into a new identity. The Spirit of God wants to lead you into, into holiness and, and righteousness. If you say, Pastor, that's me today. And this maybe is for believers, and I'll have a, a second opportunity for those who want to give their life to Christ. But maybe you're a believer here today, and you just say, hey, I want to be led by the Spirit. Would you just raise your hand? You say, Pastor, pray for me. I want to be led by the Spirit. Praise God. So many, so many want to be led by the Spirit. Praise God. You can put your hands down. Maybe you came in here today, you say, I don't even know that there is a spirit of God. I, didn't, I don't know Jesus, but I need to know him because I want to be led by the same spirit that you just spoke of. And you know that you're far from God and you've never received or put your trust in Jesus. If you've never put your trust in Jesus today, I'm going to ask you to be bold. And I'm going to ask you to, to just say a quick prayer. And as we pray this prayer for the sake of those who might be praying it for the first time, let's all pray this prayer together. Say, dear God, come on, everyone at the sound of my voice, say, dear God, thank you for sending Jesus to die on a cross for my sins. I repent and I trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you just prayed that prayer for the first time, we want to put something in your hand with every head bowed and every eye closed. Would you just shoot your hand up in the air? You say, I prayed that prayer for the very first time today. I gave my life to Christ. Shoot it up high so that we can see it. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Now to him who is able to do abundantly more and exceedingly than all we can ever ask or imagine, may the glory of God and the glory of his church be present. Let's stand to our feet today and let's worship.